Hello. Welcome everybody to the 2011 Ideas Festival. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. We've got a great little session for you and we have six very talented people to fit in a lot of information and get you guys involved, guys and girls involved in 60 minutes. Um, this is the fifth for Brisbane, Ideas Festival for Brisbane and uh, it began in 2001 and has had a couple of different venues and we're here in this pretty spectacular spot right now. My name is Luke Whistler, uh, I'll be your facilitator this afternoon and we have some special guests that I'm going to introduce very shortly. Okay, so this year the, the Ideas Festival has 11, uh, sorry, in 2011 we have three topics and they are food futures, sustainability and happiness. And we're here we are today, we're looking at is it a good time to reimagine our city? And we're picking out of that, we're starting to look at food. This is a big topic, so we're going to look at food and its role in reimagining our city. Reimagining our city comes around because of the catalyst of extreme weather events. We've just been in one in January and there may be more, definitely. So we're going to focus on those in what is a very big and difficult topic. We're going to bring it down to a few elements when we have, that is relevant to our panel members. Okay, so we're going to reimagine our city today. And in that, we're reimagining West End. It's, uh, it's very relevant from the floods and we have a number of people who are actively, actively involved right now in West End. And we're looking at the role that food has, and it's a very popular theme around the world right now, the role of food in building a more resilient, or that word sustainable, community there. And, and the different aspects that it can play in either making it more resilient during that extreme weather event and also recovering from that extreme weather event. And it may be flood or it may be something else in the future. So today, we have the scenario that I'm going to lay out very quickly. It was very long and now it's going to be very short. Um, everyone's justifiably uh, concerned about the rebuilding process physically and also that personally and emotionally for a lot of people. And so we're going to look at West End, mixed socioeconomic area that was hit very hard by the floods. I'm sure there were more hardly hit areas, but it's a good one that is just down the road for those people who aren't familiar with the local area. So there are challenging elements of retrofitting and we know or have been exposed to the scientific and technical perspectives of those, but the biggest challenge is rebuilding uh, the relationships of a community, fostering relationships, uh, considering new perspectives and establishing priorities on where to start. There's more to that, but I'm keen to begin. So the purpose of this session, the uh, Department of the Government called DERM sat down and said, we need an idea, we've got 3.30 on Friday afternoon, where do we go? A gentleman by the name of Ian White, he's a senior policy officer in DERM, and he said, listen, I've had a bit of adversity faced during January, and I think we should start talking about food and its role uh, for people to make a more resilient community. And so, Ian, without further ado, you've got seven minutes or less uh, to tell us about where you're at and set a bit of a scene for us about why it's so important that we're here today talking about this. Can everyone hear if I talk through these microphones? We also just had a little bit of a chat at the beginning. If you have questions on the way through, we'd like this to be as much of a discussion as possible rather than us talking to you. So if you have a question, just pop your hand up and someone will come down to you with a microphone. Um, Leek's asked me to open the, um, what happens today with a little bit of a story. So. I'm going to tell you my little bit of the Australian dream. If you take your mind back to 2004, it was quite dry. Uh, I was doing a plumbing apprenticeship and I found a beautiful block of land, seven acres on a river out at Ipswich. And I thought, this is the place I'm going to build my dream home. Uh, in 2006, I found a removal house from Indrapilly and took it out there and spent the next couple of years uh, renovating the house while I did a PhD on uh, rainwater as a, uh, a water sensitive house, it used about 10% of the water of a regular home, uh, using rainwater for everywhere except the sink and then there was recycling on site so I was quite self-contained and then solar and that sort of thing, I was feeling quite proud of myself. As the person who built the home I felt aware of the insurance conditions so when I rang up to buy insurance at the end I said look I live in a floodplain on a river, um, the floor's 250 over the AHD, I need to get flood insurance and they said yeah we can do that, no problems. So I bought some flood insurance. And then uh, Monday, the, was it the 10th of January, something like that, I woke up quite early in the morning, about 
So the Bremer, uh, which is usually about 50 metres away from me, the house looks down on the river, uh, was in the front yard. And I thought, this is a little bit scary, and I got my kayak out, just as a bit of a joke to myself, and walked around the yard with the cat. And through the day, the level kept rising. It was mesmerising. I thought, it can't keep coming up, it can't keep coming up. Um, but it got to the stage where the water from the river met the water uh, on the other side, which is a natural overflow. There's no sewage infrastructure. So I was standing on a little island uh, 450 metres uh, to the road and ended up kayaking out with my cat. That was all I could take. And uh, that was quite a harrowing journey. I wouldn't have attempted to swim it. Uh, I don't know what I would have done. I would have been one of the people who ended up on the roof if it wasn't for um, Mum's kayak. Thanks, Mum. Anyway, I was thinking... I've just been given permission to build on this land in the last couple of years and um, I uh, had a belief that Wyvernhoe would, would change the way that uh, Brisbane flooded and I was wrong. You know, it's a little bit King Canute, you can't really control nature when it comes down to it. But I was thinking instead of having this high value infrastructure, you know, residences and people's lives getting tied up in this sort of thing, why, is why isn't this land used for farming? It's black soil, it's uh, riparian, it's really good quality soil for growing food and what's happened is we've sprawled as a community and I'm one of the people who sprawled into this place um, but if there's a way uh, in all of this uh, um, disaster I guess uh, to return this land to a place that can grow food for the community uh, maybe linking up with Jamie Oliver's Ministry of Food or something like that and it's not just in Ipswich, there are places all around uh, Brisbane and in other cities where I really feel like the community would benefit from some of this low land, low-lying land being used to create green spaces, community spaces. In the Open IDO Festival in the last couple of days, there's been just a, a real wealth of ideas about community kitchens and training programs and um, guerrilla gardening where you grow things on trellises on the side of people's buildings. And I started thinking about the sort of community issues that were involved. I've just got a couple of minutes more, so I won't take too long. When I was little, we used to run around on the street and play with the neighbours outside until it got dark and we'd come in with bare feet and there'd be dinner on the table. And it wasn't quite the culture where we would go next door and borrow a cup of sugar uh, from the neighbours, but we certainly uh, were friendly with our neighbours. And in my lifetime, I feel like I've seen that change. Uh, uh, we've got a culture where there's three TVs and two Xboxes and a PlayStation and the, and the kids stay inside and they're glued to these uh, various video screens and I was having a look on the internet today, uh, academics uh, quoting that's life, uh, doesn't do a lot for your career prospects, but 50% um, of people uh, don't talk to their neighbours according to this magazine and even more astonishingly for me, this is from the 6th of January this year, 40% of people say they wouldn't know their neighbours if they met them in the street. I've read lots of other beautiful things about community as well. Um, uh, good fences can make good neighbours. I can vouch that a metre of chicken wire uh, in a space of fence is an excellent neighbour maker. And I was also very encouraged to read from three men, uh, Tim in Brisbane, um, David in Sydney and uh, Simon in Melbourne, saying that it's not necessarily true that living in a high density space doesn't make us talk to each other. These three men had written in 13 comments, I guess, um, to say this isn't how we see the community that we live in. So I guess with those opening thoughts, I'll turn it back to you, Luke, and we'll um, uh, keep it going from there. And if there's an idea I can leave you with uh, today, it's um, probably to be a good neighbour. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, I haven't introduced everyone yet, so before I get Emma Kate to begin, uh, while everyone digests that, I've got a few bios here, and I'm going to turn one-page bios into two lines introductions. Emma Kate Rose play, plays a uh, major role at Food Connect that a lot of you may be familiar with and Emma's on the end there and uh, she's also heavily involved in the West End community and was during the floods. Next I have Wilf and Wilf I've pulled this out at you, uh, a complex safety and mission critical systems engineer and involved at Bond Uni right now at the Sustainability School of Sustainable Development. And down the bottom, thankfully, he has transcended the world of hyper-technical and he's with us here to uh, use his expertise to build everything sustainable and transformational in our society. So, Wilf's a good man to have on board. Alison is a uh, chartered UK architect and I love it that uh, her parents were basically produced the world's first eco-village and uh, she's doing some great work at QUT right now. Uh, 
And then we have Darren, who's uh, president of the West End Community Association. We all know they're very active and they've uh, done some great work and showing some other communities how to do it well. And then Cheryl, she's an environmental engineer, uh, an lecturer at QUT also, and uh, research principal for the Natural Edge Project. And uh, Cheryl, you're committed to building capacity in biophilic urbanism, and I love that, and hopefully you'll tell us about that soon. It's basically nature-loving development, which is uh, very relevant today. So Emma, I'm going to pass it on to you right now. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, West End in particular, or how you see communities and uh, the greater role that local fruit, food production and distribution can play in building a more resilient community? Sure. Um, well, we have the fortune, personally we have the fortune to, uh, to live in a high-rise apartment, so we weren't actually flooded ourselves. We um, suffered a lot of, um, we didn't have power for a week, and we literally just watched the river just build and, you know, build up speed and build in height and all the stuff that went down, and it was quite surreal watching it all. Probably, you know, a jetty of yours probably went past our place. Um, but it was really interesting. We, we run a, a local food business and um, we didn't have any, we had one day out of the whole flood event where we didn't, where we weren't able to deliver to our subscribers. Um, and it was interesting on the Friday before the floods actually came, we were really like, oh, you know, here we go. Um, because we are a local food business, which means we depend on local farmers. And um, we were really bracing for the worst with them, but we managed to fill all our boxes and get them out to most of our subscribers. Um, and because we were stuck in West End, we thought, well, what better way than to access our warehouse and help West Enders, um, you know? So everything was in hand at, at the warehouse in Salisbury. Uh, so we just, Robert and I just focused on getting ice out to people who had lost power. Um, we had people helping us and volunteering um, you know, all over those, that, that whole build up and afterwards. Um, we were able to use a lot of our excess produce to feed people, so there were no food shortages in West End. Well, certainly not for pears and apricots and nectarines. Um, and we, like, um, like Ian mentioned, you know, the sense of community was quite, was, um, well, we just knew it was going to happen in West End. If it was going to happen anywhere, um, West End was certainly a place that was going to respond to the floods well because we have already such a strong, um, we have a very diverse community for a start and we also have a very strong sense of community and um, pitching together in times like that was of no surprise to us at all. Um, and in fact, Robert was um, delivering ice at one point um, just near Musgrave Park and he was um, approached by a couple of guys who managed the Musgrave pool and, and they saw that he'd had ice and they said, hey, um, oh, you're Robert from Food Connect, aren't you? And, and he said, yeah, yeah. And uh, they said, oh, look, we've got um, family and friends out at Bell Bowery who are stuck. And I don't know if any of you heard about the story at Bell Bowery, how they were screaming on the phones, trying to get attention from the government or the police or the army or someone. And they were literally, I don't know if you've heard of the term, they were nine meals from anarchy. Um, or three days from things turning really bad and food was um, becoming short and they had no water and no power. So these guys, being fitness freaks, decided to grab some food off us in cartons, drive the food in their four-wheel drives for as far as they could get to Bell Bowery, get out the kayaks and kayak the food and all the supplies to, these, um, to this emergency centre in Bell Bowery. And this was all under the nose of the army and the governments before anyone was able to respond. So for me, that was a brilliant example of resilience in action and how the strength of one community could actually go and help um, a, a much, uh, a, you know, a community in need that was really stuck. Yeah. Emma, being a member of Food Connect, can you quickly tell us, uh, is there a story where people start becoming a member of Food Connect? Do you have stories about... Uh, a greater sense of belonging and a connection to food mm -hmm. that starts to grow as soon as they utilise your products? Yeah, absolutely. We, um, well, our subscribers uh, take the philosophy that they share the risk with their producers. So they give them feedback all the time about the, the quality of the produce, what they'd like to see them grow. Um, you know, they, and most of it's positive. <laughs> they also um, have a chance to visit them on farm tours 
Um, we invite the farmers once a year in for a big bush dance and a hoedown and it's just making that connection and, and really valuing the contribution that they make. And not only that, from an economic point of view, um, you know, there's been quite a bit of study done in the US um, on local economies and, um, and the latest research shows that for every dollar that's spent in your local economy, it actually has a ten times multiplier effect. And so what we're actually doing is we're, we're, we're putting value, we're, you know, we're placing value on the farmer to produce that food. They're getting rewarded um, between, you know, 10, um, sorry, so the, the average farmer, the big duopoly in the supermarkets, they pay them around 5 to 15 cents in the dollar of the retail dollar. We pay our farmers between 40 and 50 cents in the dollar. So you know where, where all that in between goes is pretty much to the profits of the shareholder. Um, so, um, so when re farmers are rewarded fairly, of course you, you're going to encourage them to stay on the land and of course they value add their business which also, you know, they produce products like juices and peanut butter and all this wonderful, you know, yummy stuff and they turn their talents into a craft and then they create more jobs for more locals. So it's, it has this wonderful multiplier effect by supporting the local economy. Darren, we've got a topic here about well-being and you've probably seen uh, the West End community recovering in the last couple of months. Um, can you give us some uh, an insight to that and maybe how food could play uh, or a local food could play a larger role in that should that extreme weather event occur in our near future? Yeah, mate. Um, it was interesting, obviously, with the natural disasters as they started happening in North Queensland and then Central Queensland in the west, and then, uh, you know, lastly, it showed up here in, in the southeast corner. Um, I'm originally from North Queensland. I was kind of raised up there and, uh, you know, very, very familiar with the idea of looking after your neighbours and being there to, you know, to help out in a time of need or an emergency. And um, in fact, when I, was, when I was growing up, I was only a young boy, but the 74 floods isolated large parts of Queensland as well, and to the point where communities needed food to be flown in and then people with, uh, you know, with any health problems to be evacuated out um, by the military. So as these events started to happen, I started seeing the same scenes unfold. And then to be here, where I live three blocks away, um, also in an apartment building, um, but an old one, uh, it's 68 years old, and the water came up uh, through Melbourne Street and then came up from the river from behind us and isolated us in, in our building there. And uh, I saw the same type of attitude and the same type of, you know, generosity kick in around, around the streets in this, in this suburb here as it happened up, you know, up and down the, the river. One of the things that struck me, though, is that what we had here was the infrastructure failed. And you know, in the parlance of kind of, you know, you know, the younger people today, it was an epic fail. And the hard infrastructure especially failed. Uh, things that were reliant upon just-in-time um, food systems, and just-in-time is, is a concept whereby stores now don't have storage as, as such on site. They actually cut away that and they now rely on trucks to deliver whatever their produce is every day or every 48 hours into the store. So just-in-time food delivery is great for Coles and for Woolworths, but if those roads are cut or if the city's principal distribution centre for fresh fruit and produce is flooded, then the, Sydney, the city is incredibly vulnerable. And so then you have to fall back on what's around you, what's in the very immediate sense, what's in your building, what's in your street, what's on your block. And one of the things that really was underscored for me in this neighbourhood was that when the physical infrastructure failed, the social infrastructure kicked in. And this sense of community and community values meant that the social capital that people had invested in their neighbourhood and in their street actually started to return to them. And the idea of knowing your neighbour and knowing who was down the road and, you know, knowing people that you'll say g'day to, you know, periodically as you pass in the street. And then suddenly that relationship steps up another notch when you realise, oh, they live down the road and they have been flooded and I'll go down and lend a hand. And this, this, this idea about social capital and the, and, the, and the social infrastructure is very much where Wecker has orientated itself in recent years. And 
we, we very much invest in the opportunities to celebrate what's great about a neighbourhood, knowing full well that if you have better working relations and, and friendships and better neighbours, that when there is a time of need, you'll be able to rely on that safety net. And so that's why I think in this neighbourhood especially, we saw a lot of people chipping in very early and there was also this sense of recovery kicked in very early. There was very little kind of, oh no, how are we going to cope with this? It was very quickly into recovery. And I, I do think as a neighbourhood, it's been pretty resilient on that, on that front. I just want to make a point here. One of the first things that this city council administration decided to cut when they decided to rebuild the physical infrastructure that was a failure was the very funds that fund the community activities that happen in every neighbourhood across this city. So the little bit of money that seed funds a community festival or seed funds a, a guerrilla gardening effort, the little bit of funding that might help for a dog, a dog group to get together and maybe you know, do, do something to get a dog park going. That was one of the first things this city council cut. And yet that was the thing that saved the city and those suburbs that are in most need. So there's a couple of points I wanted to make around infrastructure and what So works. Darren, building on that, I think the social infrastructure, I think we're moving beyond food production and talking about a barbecue, sharing food, sharing uh, some cooking items that might be short, just those relationships around food to be try and pull it directly to food are important to, as soon as you know each other, they started to return your investment socially. Yeah, I've got a little bit of suburb envy of West End. I live in New Farm. We had, and my house had a little bit of uh, water in it. But uh, those three days, um, it was brilliant. I was overcome, helping out some friends who I could. And there was cricket going on when people were having a sandwich at lunch and then back into cleaning up. And all I wanted it was for that to happen every other day of the week. And I, and I, I feel, so I, I imagine in West End, it's happening more often than other suburbs. And somehow it'd be great to see that uh, replicated much more often. And I think we'd all be better for it. Was there any particular questions that anyone wanted to touch upon there about well-being with, with Darren? Have a think and uh, we'll work on one later. After that, we're going to chat with Alison about shelter and its role. Al I've seen what Alison's got to chat about and uh, she's going to pull out some real uh, key points. Uh, well, I've been asked to talk about shelter and... It's an interest, it's a huge topic because when we think of shelter, we think of uh, protection from our natural elements. But shelter for me is so much more than that. It's, um, it includes our built environment, it includes our community, in particular, um, our responsibility to protect our natural assets, our, um, be responsible for our inputs and outputs, and the resilience of our communities. Um, so the question today, is it a good time to reimagine our city? Um, albeit following a natural disaster, as many of us re West End residents have just experienced and those throughout Queensland with the floods. Um, I think it's always a good time to reimagine our city and look at how we can do it better. And I believe that the only way to do that is through radical change because the traditional methods that we have been employing with our urban design and our building design within our built environment um, are very traditional and they're not addressing um, sustainability holistically and they're not driving us closer to one planet living. Um, I think we, all of our developments should be net positive. We hear only too often people talking about zero carbon, carbon neutral, yet these are only referencing energy consumption and the reduction of energy or offsetting. But they're not talking about our well-being, about our local commerce, social issues. They're not measuring um, natural happiness, well-being. Um, and these are things that we need to incorporate within net positive development of our, of our buildings, of our built environment in regard to positive development. So developments that when you design something, it's not just improving on worse practice that we've been doing. Um, so you might put on some solar... Ray, um, raise, you might put on some insulation, so you might reduce your carbon emissions. But how is that going to enhance your local community? How's it going to bring habitat back into the area um, and make things a richer, better place to live? So if we incorporate within our buildings um, green facades, living walls, bringing that habitat in, if we, for instance, with um, our 
urban design, which has been um, got us into the problem where we have, where we see situations like Ian, where that was just poor planning. Um, and it resulted in physical development issues of a catastrophic scale. And I would like to see um, many things. One of my campaigns at the moment is that uh, we see something similar to the Merton rule that all planning approvals come with a minimum percentage of edible softscape within that development. So that, um, and that's not just for new build, but for existing. And it's very hard to regulate on existing landscapes because many of you who might have done some renovation, um, there is very little approval process or any um, regulation um, warranting how much or what you're doing, how sustainable that is. So if you were to renovate or eco-retrofit a building um, to do a sustainability audit to assess um, the solar rights of your neighbours, um, how, how you might move veg uh, vegetation around or change shading aspects so you can not just get really good natural ventilation for yourself but for your, for your neighbours. Um, on top of that, I'd like to see that with that percentage, we're getting edible landscapes integrated within the whole community. So it's a real holistic um, system that's working. And I think too with our growing population that we've got, we're going to see by 2050 our population double. By 2020, I think 25% of our population is going to be over 65. For me, I see a whole lot of gardeners that can be out there gardening our neighbourhoods and feeding us, but we're not going to get rid of the farmer. We have to support the farmer. But what we're going to do is supplement for that population growth. And particularly with 80%, was it by 2050, 80% of our population is going to be li living in coastal areas, particularly in our cities. So we're going to see less people living in regional areas. So we need to look at improving our density within our urban areas. So instead of 15, 30% dwellings per hectare that we're seeing in Brisbane, we start to move to the southeast Queensland plan of 50, 70, 100 dwellings per hectare. And we can start to see our rivers, so some of those waterfront homes that got completely flooded that probably shouldn't have been designed where they were, let's let the river reclaim its space and have rich um, agricultural river plains and recreational areas and live in, in neighbourhoods and houses where we probably don't need to consume the footprint that we're already consuming. Question just here, if we could get the microphone, that'd be great. and very expensive. The other problem is that a lot of the old timber and tin are occupied by elderly people. The, the difficulty I see is that you know, in, in order to increase your density and preserve the timber and tin, you're going to have to allow for the houses to be um, cooperative in some way. So that instead of the elderly uh, selling up because they can't cope anymore um, and moving out in the outer suburbs, um, they can stay on. And that's really what they should do because they're familiar with all the services there, they're familiar with all the, the, the community. If you want to build community, you have to encourage people to stay there. But the council uh, doesn't like this idea. You know, you either use it as a house or you run foul of all sorts of regulations. Are you a boarding house or are you a block of flats or something else? But there's no reason why the large, even a cottage could quite easily accommodate four couples in I, separate areas. I'm so glad you raised this question. This is another one of my um, campaigns at the moment. Um, currently, and this, is, this horrifies me, currently 1% of our housing in Australia is accessible. One percent. And I'll tell you what, something guaranteed in this world, we're all going to grow old. We're all going to find it a bit harder to get upstairs, to reach that light switch that's hot, higher up. We're all going to need a little bit of assistance. And moving house is, is traumatic, it's expensive, 
it's stressful and you're moving away from your social network and that community that you've probably built up over, over a number of years. Um, with our ageing population, with the statistics that I mentioned before, by 2020, we're going to need 60% of our dwellings to be accessible for our occupants, for our ageing occupants. So in the next, what is it, 2011, we've got nine years to um, increase our accessibility of our residences by 59%. That's astronomical. And then we start to look at um, some of the flood prone um, areas where they're bringing in this new local planning instrument of um, building levels to be increased, building heights increased, um, raising the location of services, um, resilient building materials. But if we're going to start looking at higher buildings, how do people with access mobility issues get into those dwellings? Um, and also on the point of co-housing and share housing. Um, I think it's the only way, particularly for ageing people, where you are less mobile, why not set up your golden girl household? Look how much fun they had. Um, but then how do we support that? That's not going to be a government directive. I can't see that being mandated. That's got to come from some of the community support organisations and networking. Um, so building on that, so what was your name? Don. Don. So building on Don's element, and I think it's relevant to reimagining our city, not directly relevant to food, but there's a key point in that is that what makes some of, as I'd say, West End in particular is the wide branch of demographics. And you need that influence of an older generation as well as the young students. You need that whole breadth. And having a big suburb full of very rich and large houses, you start to squeeze out the extremities. And so I think that's a very important thing of being able to support that um, element and it comes with our approvals as well as a co-housing element and uh, uh, without authority as well and changing a bit of mindset there. I, I don't know if I can respond thoroughly to your question about affordability but diversification is very important particularly across the demographic, um, culturally I think to, to bring that into a community um, and to give it its richness. And so when we start to look at um, eco-retrofitting urban areas to increase density, it's a very um, delicate topic because you have some homeowners uh, within that area who mightn't want to, you know, they think, it's the NIMBY, not in my backyard. We'll densify this area over here, but they're not willing to do it themselves. Um, and I think it's like through education and awareness and through... Um, government regulations to encourage people to increase that densification, but still maintain the character and the diversity of our areas. Um, and I'll just add that high rises aren't necessarily the solution. Um, if you look at, say, Notting Hill in London, where average buildings are uh, five to six storey high, they have a density of 70 dwellings per hectare. And that's not much. Is that low for um, everyone who... Well, we're about, we're about 15 to 30 in okay, Brisbane. Great. And the South East Queensland plan is aiming at um, what's well, quite broad. I mean, how do you interpret this? South East Queensland Regional Plan for Smart Growth Centres, which West End would be, is 30 to 120 dwellings per hectare. There's a Notting Hill in there somewhere. Uh, we've looked at commerce, well-being, and shelter from Alison then. Cheryl, I'm going to get you to look at nature. Um, how, 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 will our, how does nature contribute to uh, our communities and our built environment? And I'll let you expand on that in your own manner also. Thanks, Luke. Well, I think I've got two minutes, have I? About two or three minutes. About that. So I'll keep it short. A few ideas have occurred to me as the other speakers have been talking, so I think I'll focus on them more than what I brought into today because I think that's more relevant for this discussion. And I start off by thinking about the question, is this a good time to reimagine our city? And I would say that from a nature perspective, absolutely yes. We've seen nature in force around the world, like no time in recent history with the, um, not only in Queensland, although Queensland's been quite a centre, but around the world with the increased hurricane um, phenomena and the intensity of those um, storm cells, 
uh, and drought and flooding. So I think as we consider nature as quite a forceful phenomenon, I put it to you today that we might actually see that our relationship isn't adversarial. We're not sort of at, um, at war with nature in terms of stopping it coming into our lounge rooms or stopping it coming into our lives. But actually we could revision our relationship with nature and this is a perfect time to say to ourselves, can our relationship with nature be synergistic or you know, in line with nature rather than adversarial? And that gives me enormous opportunities to sort of sit here and daydream about what we could envisage for Brisbane in that context. And I thought about the, um, the water dimension of nature and I thought, well, when we think about nature and its connection with water, it's very, very complex and quite uh, a number of niches exist in our natural environment when we think of anything from ponds through to the beach through to rainfall and storm, what we call storm water that falls on our houses and then goes somewhere. And I am thinking, a colleague actually said to me, um, I was in Canberra uh, yesterday, and a colleague said to me down there, isn't it great that up in Brisbane they're starting to see water as a phenomenon that we can live with through all these different climate events rather than just seeing water as something that's displaced during flood, you know. Water's a natural part of our lifestyle in a river city. And if we can live with water, well then let's imagine opportunities in our natural systems. Maybe we can use open spaces in Brisbane a little bit more, um, a bit smarter, to be open spaces that we can enjoy apart, you know, instead of being river frontages that are private for dwellings that are gonna go under with this extreme weather pattern that's starting to become a bit more regular. Maybe we can feature in those open water, water friendly reserves, storytelling of our recent flood events and our relationship with nature in dealing with those, you know, there's some fantastic stories about community and nature and how they're relating um, within our lifetimes that we can share. And then create in Brisbane, an environment where we celebrate our complex relationship with water. So we have the river as our front door and we're seeing that through the River Festival and you know, other community events that really showcase that. But there are many other ways that we can create really positive and um, visionary relationships with water from you know, the rainwater tanks and the story around Brisbane in hating them, loving them, hating them, loving them and, uh, and what happens with that micro storage story with, um, with really embracing our creeks and we've got so many amazing creek community groups in Brisbane that also form a really important social fabric as well as providing that essential uh, connection with nature that's in our front and our backyards. So, you know, those things occur to me in terms of reimagining our city. I would suggest possibly that Brisbane being the river city in Australia arguably has the most potential to use this recent catastrophe. And, you know, I was in Adelaide during the floods. And I live in Carina, so I knew my house was safe, it was on a hill. But I felt so detached from the catastrophe unfolding up here, and all I had to look at was the ABC News, and you know, it was just there. And I felt such a strong desire to be part of the community as it faced this catastrophe in January. And I actually feel a sense of oh, resentment or frustration that I couldn't be here which is, I find quite unusual as a human being to have that, you know, should be, oh gosh, lucky I escaped that one. But the amount of community that resulted from that um, event um, would be, wouldn't it be fantastic if we took that and, as Luke said, got those cricket games happening a bit more often, but celebrated water and rather than putting that event, um, put the event itself in the past because it happened and, you know, the bad stuff happened and there were some terrible, uh, events that happened, but we learnt so much and the, the relationships that we have now are, uh, I would suggest, in many areas, richer and stronger. And let's use that to create our future. Terrific. I'm going to jump straight over to Wilf. Wilf, you're, you've got the tag of, uh, to look at systems and I think you've got a, a couple of particular things to say, but I'm also thinking of uh, um, where do we start with taking some action and... Um, and uh, should it have structure or should we be leaving this uh, place today and 
getting ourselves sorted to make it happen quicker than the government can. I've got a whole uh, load of notes that I've written for myself here that I've realised are a load of rubbish. And I look at the question and then I look around everybody in this room and I think, is this the question? Do we need to reimagine our city or do we need to reimagine ourselves? That's a deep question. Do we move from being consumers to true citizens? Does this become the way in which we meet to make decisions about the systems that we all take part in? Uh, a true participatory democracy. Uh, how often do we have these sorts of get-togethers? Or the gentleman down the front here talking about uh, you know, an elitist takeover. And I'm not saying this from a communist perspective. I'm looking at it from a systems perspective when we look at what does resilience really mean? Uh, what are the characteristics of resilient systems? Number one, diversity. When I look around West End as a, a resident of West End, you know, that, that diversity is what held the place together. As, as Darren spoke about the, uh, the social capital that was there. Secondly, modularity which really means bits and pieces of the system can break without it falling to the bottom, without it truly, totally collapsing. Then we need some sort of, what I call, and I apologise for the technical language here, tightly coupled, transparent, low hysteresis feedback, which really means when we do something or something happens, we get a quick response and we can make decisions within a time frame before it gets so out of hand that we can't deal with it. And lastly, which comes down to Ian's issue about planning, is about safety margins. How much safety margin do we want to build in? That should be part of the people's conversation. And if we look even deeper and we start asking questions about, are we getting happier? And are we building more resilience for all of this growth and all of this complexity that we're adding in? It seems to me that we've got an incredibly diminishing return on our happiness and our resilience, and that's something we need to have a conversation about. Also, coming from uh, this part of town, what an amazing uh, opportunity to really get to know the people that were here before us, the Jagara and Turrbal people from this area who knew this place to a T. Right? Where does that fit into our conversation about the sort of people that we want to become to have a city that's truly worthy of our humanity? That's it from me. Terrific. Goodness. Uh, I don't know where to move from there. Um, so we have uh, about 10 minutes to go. And Alison, if you do need to head off, you'll be careful of the uh, ankle reflectors if you'll be able to see her coming Actually, through. Luke, Thank you very much, Alison. That was terrific. We appreciate your effort. If you have any specific questions for Alison, uh, I'm happy to pass them on and put you in touch with her. Go for it, Wilf. There was one other comment, which was also about uh, your comment, sir. And that, that is if we do take a, a different view of Brisbane, um, what we know about nature is that it's always at the fringes of, uh, you know, the budding up of land and sea where we have the most fecundity and the most productivity and the most innovation and creativity. Right? And one of the things we need to think about is, you know, a place like West End, you know, by gentrifying it and making it bigger and growing it, what does Brisbane as a whole lose in terms of its overarching innovation and creativity if we cut the fringes off? You know, these are all big questions for us to think about the whole city. It's, it's not just one part, it's a whole. Right? And there's some tremendous opportunity to have a conversation about that. Hang on a moment, Rolf. So I want to uh, think about where, where I'd go from this tomorrow as... Uh, not only as the facilitator, but as a resident with everyone else. Because uh, there's a lot of big issues and we all don't have the capacity to nail them all solo. So, I mean, as you were saying, Darren, do I go out and have a barbecue with my neighbours to make sure I know them for next time? Do I uh, grow some food on the sidewalk that my neighbour can lend or someone can steal and catch them and then be friends with them? Or um, do I grow food on the side of buildings? Where do, is that? Is, do I start there to start reimagining my own day-to-day -day life if I don't have the capacity as I'm not a Lord Mayor of Brisbane, so I've got to start in my own backyard with my kids? Can someone, can someone build on that? Is that where we're telling or asking people to head to? I just wanted to, I just want to raise one point about the food and about you know, local production, and it's something that we've been working on for a little bit as well. Um, 
There's a street near here, uh, Hampstead Road, which goes up to Highgate Hill. It's a wide street. Uh, just historically, it's been, you know, it's been developed that way. 60% um, of that road, so this is the pavement and the bitumen, is surplus to road requirements. So 60% of it you could, you could reuse for some other purpose and still maintain the same level of service on that street. However, to this day, Brisbane City Council has an ordinance which forbids the production and the growing of edible food on City Council land. Today. Really? So it's illegal. Because they're afraid of attracting fruit bats to the city of Brisbane. Now, something as specific and as simple as legislating, a changing a, a, a regulation in this city to enable people to grow and to produce fruit and produce on the piece of land that's in front of your house or it's in a park or something that's surplus to a road requirement. At the moment, the city puts a priority on having surplus bitumen than having locally produced fruit and vegetables. Now, we either wait on the council to finally figure that doesn't make sense or we do it ourselves. But there's something very specific, very simple. You either let the fruit bats lead the way or we to say people are a bit more of a priority. So. And Sounds like an action for ordinance us. Ordinance has changed too. It wasn't so long ago that eating al fresco was uh, against the law uh, because people were worried about the um, health risks of eating outside. Things that we take for granted now can in a short time uh, move. Can I also add uh, to the element about growing your own food? I think it uh, definitely leads to uh, appreciating your own uh, fr fragility. Uh, I've got a little dwarf lemon tree and I've been harbouring five big juicy lemons. It's taken six months. We had a barbecue the other day and I had one there and I presented it. No one really listened. And then I <laughs> chopped it up and consumed it and I kept a piece. I've still got a piece and it was gone. And that was six months worth of work. I was devastated. So I think... <laughs> Uh, even just producing something yourself, you start to appreciate and, and in your households, you may not agree, but if you start to share those stories and the bit of rosemary that's on the lamb that night's from this tiny little pot on the patio, that starts to build an understanding of our, where, we, where we sit. Can I uh, invite a few questions? Roll feel first, stand up, bellow out while we're waiting for the microphone. Ladies and gents, we've got uh, about 10 minutes. We're all still going to be here afterwards, but I think we have a timeline we have to close. Fire away. I went to a talk earlier today about um, post-recovery health systems, and the conversation actually more went to, uh, I suppose you call it the slow burn um, disaster that our health is at at the moment. And 5% uh, of our health budget is spent on prevention rather than the cure. So uh, my reimagine for our city would actually be to turn our community gardens into the new health systems of the, this century and to be funded appropriately with some of the uh, therapies to include things like perma blitzes and growing on the footpaths. Your comments? I'd like to comment. Um, yeah, we, um, we've noticed a significant change. We recently surveyed our subscribers and basically when you get a box from us, you pretty much have to deal with the box and become really good cooks and, um, um, you know, educate, educated about where it comes from. And most of our subscribers have said that um, by having a box every week of fresh vegetables or by participating in a local food um, uh, movement, such as community gardens or even growing some of their own, that their health has improved remarkably because the nutrient density that you receive from locally produced fresh food is so much higher because it hasn't been sitting around in a cold room for six to 12 months waiting for a supermarket truck to come and pick it up and put it on the shelf. So they say these days that an apple in a supermarket um, has, a, has um, a quarter of the nutritional density than an apple had 50 years ago. So, um, I mean, that example in itself um, is indicative of the health system at the moment where we're at. I mean, food is medicine, and um, the more fresh, you know, food you eat, the less need you need to have to go and um, address those health issues with the big, you know, the, the big um, cumbersome health system we have. Emma, do you think they clean and brush your teeth less than they did <laughs> 20 years ago? <laughs> 
Um, any more questions? I think there are a couple more. Shoot, ma'am. If you can start again on that, that'd be great. Okay. Testing one, two, three. Go for it. Okay, collaborative consumption, sharing, mm -hmm. which is what you're talking about, and we are also talking about. Anyway. You'd like uh, a comment? Like to, oh. Yeah, uh, on that topic, if someone could comment, because we have a lot of uh, just speak a little bags bit, at home. Just speak a little bit closer, if, sorry, ma'am, so we can hear. Which we don't use. Uh, lawn mowers sitting in the garage. Mm -hmm. uh, cars and bicycles are put into place by the city council at the moment. On, na on the nature note, uh, I'd like to have a water festival, water celebration uh, festival, water blessing for the Brisbane city. Okay, so I think a collaborative consumption, which is food, tools, everything. I'm, Commerce. Uh, any comments? Or I, mean, I think everyone agrees. Those ideas have been discussed intensely at uh, the Open IDO uh, forums in the, over the last two days. And there are, I think, somewhere between six and 20 projects that have come forward, including uh, maybe in uh, West End, uh, making a space which could be a community kitchen. Uh, it could be linked to uh, um, guerrilla gardening, where uh, people uh, have been uh, growing cucumbers and that sort of thing against the sides of buildings. or. Um, uh, sourcing food that uh, maybe doesn't uh, suit what happens in the supermarket about being perfectly red and round but not necessarily having any flavour um, to ideas where um, you can uh, come along on Thursday night and taste Nonna's Napoli sauce. Um, there's such a, a rich culture of, of a, a Mediterranean and Asian uh, heritage in the area um, to be sharing recipes in a community space. Uh, for people to have access to facilities, you know, like uh, cold rooms and that sort of thing if they're trying to build their own businesses. Mm -hmm. And there is a real wealth of ideas that has been happening in the space and the state government is looking at um, what, what can be done to give some of those ideas some support. Um, so if I can build on that, just to be clear, Open IDO is it's a fellow in Europe who started it, not sure how recently, probably a couple of years ago, uh, it's a global innovation platform for solving problems and the Premier and the government's got hold of that fellow as a consultant and said we're having an ideas festival. We want our ideas to be put around Brisbane and the world and then the rest of them see it, an open source type scenario for the web. People like it and they love it and it gets, gathers momentum. People uh, advise improvements from their own experience and you start to build an idea that's maybe you're having in the backyard or on your couch and you share with people and start to build it. So. It is a great thing that I think there's some sessions that have been ongoing that Ian referred to. Um, and if you're unsure, go to the web and look at Open IDO uh, and you'll start to understand uh, if you have some ideas, get it up there and watch it grow. We are in a culture that is really about to go through some very big changes. The, uh, the uh, transition of the baby boomers to retirement, um, the way that global food production is happening, the way that uh, Australia has moved to a reliance on mining as an industry and there's conflicts between what we do with our um, good quality uh, farming land versus uh, taking minerals out of the ground and uh, living as uh, though we run a quarry. There are some really big challenges but it's also been a uh, really enjoyable part of this festival how much energy there is uh, for people to build on each other's ideas and it seems to me like we're all just champing at the bit waiting for someone to fire the gun at the moment. Um, well, I don't necessarily agree with that because I think there's a lot of people who have already fired that gun re Great. regardless of government support. And I think that's what we actually need to encourage and this is what Will's talking about with participatory democracy, you know, grassroots action. I think, you know, if you asked anybody in this room what's your big idea, I'm sure you know, everyone would put their hand up and if we all said to them, if you had the opportunity and if we could facilitate that big idea for you in this community, what do you need and how can we help you? And that's the approach we take at West End Community Association, you know. We, we have so many people in the community who come to us now and say, I've got this great idea. We go, great, we'll, we'll tell the whole membership and they'll help you. <laughs> and there's been amazing, um, amazing community events and, and programs and initiatives that have happened at the grassroots level and not one cent of council or federal or state government money 
has entered the scene. We've asked for it, but you know, you still got to ask. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's not it's we, it's not like we have to sit still and not do something and wait for the government to press the go button. But yes, it's good to see the government starting to wake up and starting to think, okay, how do we get more resilient? Local local solutions is yes. the way to go. Cheryl? Yeah, uh, perhaps as one of the closing things today, I've, there's a mentor of, um, of ours in the US, her name's Janine Benyus, and she has this con concept called biomimicry, which is innovation inspired by nature. And she says what happens with nature is when there's some sort of catastrophe or something really big happens that really decimates a population or you know, kills off a certain area of, um, of reserve, then what happens after that is this incredible burgeoning of biodiversity. You know, you think of a fire, then a fire comes through and everything dies, dies off from what we can see, but then new things start to sprout and you really get a flourishing of new green growth. And I, I look at Brisbane and I see, and actually I look at a, the planet as part of my job, and you see all of these um, crises occurring around the world that where nature is really yelling at us that something is wrong and that we are upsetting the equilibrium. And, you know, Janine, our mentor, she says, think of it like a little knot hole in a tree. And when you look through this period of extreme unrest and uncertainty with what's happening in human beings, figuring out our relationship with this planet, think of it that you're looking through this tiny knot hole and if you put your, your hand up to your face, I don't know if you want to try it, but you look through and you can kind of see bits and pieces, but you can't really see the full picture. And we get some ideas and we can see a bit of vision and everyone, everyone's looking through a different knot hole. And I suggest that what we need to do is have a lot of people looking through a lot of knot holes because if we're all lined up along the fence and we can all see a bit and we all talk to each other, perhaps we can get to the other side of that, you know, real burgeoning of, of um, creativity and innovation and move out of this period of unrest and uncertainty and uncomfortable position with our natural environment to a space where we really are so synergy, so aligned and so, um, so satisfied um, that the human population and all of those other species that we're supposed to be trying to protect as well in this process can actually survive on this one planet. Whereas all the stats at the moment are saying that we need four of this planet to hold the seven billion people or so that we're going to have by the middle of this century. So, you know, Brisbane, I think, could be a roaring example of, of a really dynamic space where we can do that and demonstrate that human beings and nature can really flourish together. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, it's 4.30. That doesn't mean we're going to end, but I'm going to let people leave if they'd like to. Uh, so formally, I'd like to thank the expert panel. That was terrific. If you could all thank them with your hands. Um, no one's telling us to leave right now, so I'd like to continue. But before we just get into some general exchange, continue the conversation, I've sort of seen a couple of notes that I'm going to take away from this and make sure it... Derm or the Queensland Department, uh, we get it into open.idio and they hear what we've been talking about today. And that's talking about, I think there were some barriers about Brisbane City Council and our surplus bitumen that they like to protect <laughs> and also getting some diversity in inner city. So doing that through our government channels and you privately in your own time I think is key. Uh, Ma'am, there was a question up the back. Please feel free to leave but we're going to continue the discussion until someone asks us to stop. If you'd like to stand up ma'am and it out, where's, that'd be great. Where's the microphone? Where's the microphone? They've gone. Is everyone healthy in West End? Is anyone overweight? I know it's appropriate to have a bit of safety margin as well. <laughs> uh. Uh, it's an interesting question, actually. Um, but no, I think you know the the suburb lends itself, even though we don't have dedicated bikeways that we'd like to have and big wide pedestrian spaces that we'd love to have, um, it is a pretty active suburb. There's a lot of walking, a lot of cycling anyway. Um, people do have reclaimed the streets in West End and um, you know it's really a case of the cars have to look out for the pedestrians and cyclists rather than the other way around. Yeah, yeah, they're food deserts. They're actually called food deserts. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, absolutely, and that's You're the right, crux, crux of the issue. 
It that does provide some inspiration, though. Yes. That it can happen. There, where there, you live. West End isn't the only place that um, uh, things are being considered. Uh, yesterday, someone was talking about setting up a farmer's market at Darra Station. Uh, and again, there was discussion uh, Darra Station has access to great Asian uh, vegetable mm, grocers. Why, does, why do things need to be set up there? That isn't even one of the disadvantaged suburbs. Uh, but the coming together can happen in a lot of spaces. And the idea about having something at Dara was to introduce people who may not be so aware of Asian foods to introduce those into their diet. Now, I remember um, uh, yesterday someone uh, cited from a Queensland government website that 70% of people in southeast Queensland are overweight to the point that they have an increased risk of diabetes or stroke. And uh, there are uh, these places uh, which you're saying are food deserts, you can go, there's a strip of KFC and Hungry Jacks and McDonald's and whatever you like like that. Um, but there aren't um, the, the places, because food and veg has become so expensive relative to these other foods and these other foods are convenient, we need to um, re-inculcate the whole process of having fresh fruits and vegetables and, and a range of different things in our diets. It's been really exciting to see, um, although it's kind of annoying television, the uh, young master chefs and, and mm. this whole uh, revolution of people becoming interested in cooking again. And a, a real lead in uh, from that is uh, where are people going to be getting this food to do things from? Because once you've started exploring cooking, you get a little bit tired of eating the same three things that are on um, you know, the vegetable choices at Coles or Woolies, you start looking for different foods. Ian, can I interrupt? We've, yep. uh, someone has asked us to stop. Wilf, I'm going to let you finish, wrap up. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Um, each of the panel members up here, I'm sure they have lots of little ideas that they ha aren't yet to bring to the service, like probably each of you in here. So they're not experts. They haven't solved all their own ideas. They are in the same position as everyone. So please take it forward. Find some support and do it. It will hand over to you to finish. Thank you very much, everybody. That was terrific. Will? Oh, look, okay. Oh. These, these were just some last comments. What a great opportunity to slow down, stay put, grow up, get to know each other, and think deeply about where we're going. I mean, and just thinking about that, that sort of the conversation about food then, maybe we should ask the question about the whole metabolism of Brisbane itself, not just as individuals. How obese is Brisbane? Right? How obese is South East Queensland and what is it feeding on? Right? And how long is that food source going to be around if we look at it as economic activity? So different ways of thinking about all these things at different system scales.